Well, welcome everybody to part three of the uh, Center for Real Estate uh, uh, Fall uh, 2020 uh, Real Estate Strategies Conference. Uh, my name is Andy Hunt. I'm the director of the Center for Real Estate here at Marquette University, and we are thrilled to have you all join us uh, again today. Uh, we have a very packed schedule, so we'd like to get started. Uh, we have a few an announcements and some acknowledgements before we are going to go ahead and release the results of our 2020 retrospective survey, as well as have our panel go ahead and break down those uh, fascinating results that we have been able to experience. So first things first, uh, we, we, want to, we want to thank everybody who, who had the chance to join parts one and parts two of our conference. Part one, the CEO Insights with uh, the global CEO of CBR in, uh, CBRE, uh, Bob Salentic, joined us back in September. Part two in October featured our diversity in real estate panel and an incredible discussion on increasing diversity within our, uh, with, within our industry. And then of course, here we are today focusing on uh, part three, 2020 retrospective trends survey, looking at the biggest trends of the last 10 years and the biggest uh, likeliest trends of the next 10. I'd like, also like to, to take a moment to congratulate our award winners this year. Uh, we Every year, the Marquette University Center for Real Estate and the Real Estate Alumni Network Realm uh, hand out two awards, the Service to Marquette Real Estate Award and the Deal of the Year Award. This year's award winners uh, include Bill Scheel for the Service to Marquette Real Estate Award. Bill is a 1976 alum of Marquette University, a longtime supporter of the Center for Real Estate Program, a former board chair of the, of the Center for Real Estate Advisory Board, and uh, an incredible friend to our program. Our Deal of the Year Award this year goes to Prologis Georgetown Crossroads. This project was completed in just south of Seattle, Washington by Prologis. Uh, the, uh, the sponsoring company uh, leader is Dan Letter, president of the Central Region for Prologis, as the first uh, multi-story industrial building uh, to be uh, developed in the United States. This incredible project is more than deserving of our recognition as a deal of the year. So congratulations to Prologis and to our alum, Dan Letter, who is also a panelist for our program today. One quick reminder for our audience, our silent auction uh, fundraiser for our program is going on now. It is virtual and it is live. So the auction closes tomorrow night at 6 p.m. But please take a moment to go to the auction website. That's at GEG, that Golden Eagle Gala, GEG 2020. Dot givesmart.com. We have several incredible auction items that we ask everyone to go ahead and take a look and to please bid and be generous. All proceeds from the silent auction go to support students and programming uh, here at Marquette University for the real estate program. So thank you so much for your support. Now, on to, the, on to a few thank yous. Uh, we would not be able to be here today without our incredible sponsors. And thank you so much to our amazing platinum level sponsors, Associated Bank, CBRE, and Prologis. Your support has meant the absolute world to us and we, uh, we really can't thank you enough. Also, a huge thank you to our gold level sponsors, Collier's, uh, Connor Commercial Real Estate, uh, Mishon Properties, Mid-America Real Estate Group, North Shore Bank, Phoenix Investors, and Wind Trust and Town Bank. Thank you all to our Gold Level sponsors. Again, an incredible level of support from you. Our silver sponsors, C.D. Smith Construction, Cobalt Partners, First Weber Realtors, Knightberry Title Group, Mandel Group, Ogden and Company, Pine Tree Commercial, Trammell Crow Company, and Von Briesen. I thank you all for, for your sponsorship and our, our Blue Level sponsors, Capital Seniors Housing, Sarah's Partners, Four Investment Group, Heitman, Kelman Restoration, Corbin Associates Architects, Marcus and Millichap, Michael Best and Frederick, MLG Capital, Northwestern Mutual, Physician Realty Trust, Space Co, and WIDA. Again, thank you all to all of our sponsors for your incredible support and in making today happen. Of course, our board members are the linchpin of everything that we do. Uh, we cannot thank them enough as well for their support and their pushing of our program to even greater heights throughout the year. Uh, huge thanks to all of our, our board members that are listed here, as well as huge thanks to our legacy members. These are our top tier financial supporters of our program. Without you, none of the work that we do is possible. Now, on to the survey. As you can see here, the, we'll quickly go through our demographics before releasing the top 10 trends uh, for both the past and the future. But without a doubt, the survey was an incredible success. 
we had uh, 202 people take take this survey this year. Uh, we were hoping for around uh, 100 to 125 participants. So 200 uh, participants absolutely shatters our best expectations. Uh, thank you to all of you who are a part of taking that survey and for your incredibly insightful feedback. Notably, we had a, a large co contingent of, uh, of professionals from real estate advisory or service firms and the real estate development community, community that were involved, as well as uh, a plethora of other parts of the industry and uh, banks and other lenders that uh, really made up uh, more than 10, between 10 and 10% 10 and a quarter of the respondents to our survey. Notably, the data is very high quality. When you look at the level of experience, our average level of experience was uh, was somewhere w w over 85% of our respondents had uh, 10 years or more of experience within the industry. The way that we look at this from a data standpoint is that 85% um, of, of the respondents, so the vast majority of, of the data that comes out of this was from individuals, many of you who have been through at least one cycle. Um, and for 50% of the respondents that have been through multiple cycles, having more than 20 years of experience. Uh, again, incredible results in terms of the quality of our data, and we can't thank you all enough for being part of that. And then, of course, uh, and, and as is to be expected, the, from a regional standpoint, we're very Midwest heavy. That's us here at Marquette in the Center for Real Estate. That's you as our supporters. Uh, so we thank you all so much for uh, for for taking part in the in, in this, but also uh, from several respondents from outside of the Midwest that are participating as well. So we do have a national flavor to these results, which is which is great. I'm very excited to announce the top 10 trends of the past decade as, uh, as given by the responses to our survey. Uh, number one is the low interest rate environment. Uh, this had the largest share of percentage. This was 16.5% of our weighted uh, number of, of total response. This also had 55 first place votes, uh, the most first place, place votes of, of both the 10 trends of the past and the trend, 10 trends of the future. So the low interest rate environment really seems to be a big driver of uh, and the biggest trend of the last 10 years in the minds of a lot of people. That's followed by a growth in e-commerce, increasing access to capital, and increased allocation toward real estate by institutional investors. Number three and number four, of course, are linked, but are separate, which is uh, uh, something that's interesting. Increasing construction costs has been a big story in the last 10 years as well. And then we round out the top 10 with industrial strength as an asset class, as, as an emerging asset class in the last 10 years. The rise and fall of big box retail and deconstruction of the main street. The rise in affordability issues within major cities. Cities regaining strength and, as hubs for corporate office locations. And the last mile and its importance, importance on real estate locations. Uh, I should note that when you look at this table, you'll note that the top 10 trends and then the weight, you may have some questions about the weighting. So the way that we decided to do the, the weighting for our results was we took all the results and we attached a point value to the top five responses that you gave us. So for example, for every, every person who voted low interest rate as, as environment as your number one choice, we attached a score of five points to that number one ranking. For those that had it as their second, we attached a score of four, third was three, their fourth place was two points, and their fifth place got one point. It received no points if it was outside of, uh, of the top five responses. So for example, for lowest interest rate environment, um, if you, uh, because we had, um, uh, uh, you know, say you had 10 people that gave it first place votes, that would be 50 points that we would attach to this. We then took that overall point weighting and then we, add, and then we uh, attached a percentage to it to better understand where things landed. We took the scoring system based off of the, uh, the trend survey that Robert Fishman at Rutgers University did uh, back in the year 2000, looking at trends in the last 50 years and the American metropolitan, uh, metropo met metropolis at the time uh, and looking forward at the next 50 years, a very interesting thought exercise at the time, something that we thought was worth, uh, worth doing here as well. Those are the top trends of the past decade. Let's look at, at, ahead at the top trends, the likeliest trends, future trends of the, of the decade ahead. Number one was e-commerce and the rise in distribution continuing. Uh, that receives 35 first place votes. Um, but interestingly enough, not the most first place votes. That would actually go to number two, the shift in workplace flexibility and working from home. Obviously within our waiting system, uh, the, the e-commerce edged that out for the first place slot. slot. But as you can see, the percent weight and then the difference between first place votes really makes these almost identical in terms of the top two most likely trends that you were expecting within the industry. 
Uh, the next tier would be the continued low interest rate environment. But interestingly, although continued low interest rate environment was at number three, a rise in interest rates came in at number nine on this list, as you can see, uh, with a 4% weighted vote and actually nine first place votes. Uh, that's compared to the uh, 29 first place votes for a continued low interest rate, rate environment uh, at number three. But a really interesting dichotomy there that uh, obviously we're not quite sure what's going to happen in the, in the marketplace but we can think about it and try to plan um, uh, for both scenarios. Number four, millennials moving back to the suburbs in the next 10 years seem to be another really popular trend, gaining 11 first place votes. And then number five, growing healthcare needs across the spectrum. So two demographic linked trends there with millennials aging um, and baby boomers aging and, uh, and from a healthcare standpoint. Uh, number six through 10, automation and robots being a major trend, something that we're looking at, re redevelopment of malls into new uses, another trend on its way that uh, I think respondents are expecting will, uh, will only increase uh, in velocity. Global warming and sustainability, a very popular one, notably 11 first place votes. Uh, so um, would be in the top five, if you will, if we were just going by first place votes. I think that's notable uh, in terms of uh, us thinking through this top 10 list. And then uh, rise in interest rates, as we as we said in number ten, another form of federal legislation uh, that changes the industry. That uh, a lot of people are starting to think about what might happen there. All right, let's uh, let's move forward and introduce our panel. Our moderators today, we're very excited to have Kevin Smith. Kevin is the instructor of practice here at Marquette University, teaching the real estate cases course, the capstone course for the real estate, uh, for all the students in our real estate program. Uh, Kevin uh, hails from uh, um, Madison, New Jersey, uh, where for 35 years he had the chance to lead uh, Prudential Real Estate Investment, uh, most recently retiring as the Senior Managing Director and Head of the Americas for Prudential uh, Real Estate Investment. Um, Kevin also is a trustee at a Willamette University in Oregon and uh, has been a phenomenal addition to the real estate program, spending some time at his lake house here in Beaver Dam and, uh, and allowing our students uh, to really thrive from the cases that he's able to bring from his experience. So Kevin, welcome and thank you for being our moderator today. And of course, our panelists. Adam Hooper, the Chief Executive Officer of Real Crowd. Lisa Konechka, the Executive Vice President of CBRE, focused on the office sector. Dan Letter, President of the Central Region for Prologis, focused on the industrial sector. And Stan, Stan Nitzberg, a principal with Mid-America Real Estate, focusing on the retail sector. I should mention that Adam uh, focuses a lot on the uh, multifamily sector and, of course, on emerging technology trends within real estate. So welcome to all of our panelists. It is a pleasure to have all of you here today. Uh, and um, Kevin, take it away. Okay. Um, it's Andy, I can't seem to start my video. It says you've stopped it, so something the host has stopped it. So, um, but while we while we get that um, taken care of, um, I just want to, you know, before before we turn to the questions for the panel, thank all of you for filling out this uh, survey. It gives us a lot of good fodder for discussion today, um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion and. And it's great because I get to ask the questions and put these these four folks on the, on the spot. Um, Kevin, go ahead and try your uh, try, try your camera one more time. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so I'd encourage you to, uh, as we go through this, uh, questions uh, come to mind. Um, you know, post them up on the the chat uh, feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be watching those and maybe we can get to some of those in real time rather than waiting to the end, but we will have a, a Q&A, um, uh, some time reserved for Q&A at the end. So with that, we're gonna jump right into it. So um, do you wanna put the, the top 10 um, list just as a reference, Andy? Uh, so we, before we start asking the questions, so um, we're not gonna have this up, up the whole time. Um, I want you to, to uh, see the people answering the questions. But so we'll start with the trends of the past decade uh, first, and then we'll spend probably a little bit more time on the future trends, which I, I think will, is a little bit more interesting, but it's, it's always good to look pack, uh, back. So let me start with you, Dan. Um, E-commerce, which appears on both lists, the star of the past and the future, uh, growth in e-commerce. We hear about it constantly, um, you know, we can't get 
anywhere without hearing and seeing what Amazon is up to. But you, can you talk about its impact on the industrial market specifically? Sure. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Um, let me start by talking about Halloween last weekend. Um, we just left my house. We went next door to go to one of the eight houses we trick-or-treated at. And an Amazon Prime van pulls up in front of my house. We're with about three or four families, social distancing, of course. Uh, and the Amazon Prime van pulls up in front of my house. We're at the neighbors and the guy gets out. And my seven-year-old daughter and her friend scream at the Amazon Prime delivery guy saying, I love you, Amazon Prime. I love you. And I was, it was, they were going bananas. I actually saw them do this on the first day of school too. And little did they know that I wanted to yell at them too and say, I love you too, Amazon Prime, but not just because you bring me packages. Uh, so it's uh, a, a story that uh, warms my heart, but uh, really it's no surprise that e-commerce was the top uh, trend here, especially given how we've all been living over the last seven or eight months. Uh, even the slow adopters uh, are now seeing how e-commerce is such a necessity, uh, in, in especially in a uh, work from home environment, stay at home uh, environment. Uh, so yes, e-commerce was by far the biggest structural driver in industrial real estate last cycle. And overall, it's really still early. Just look what happened. Uh, COVID-19 pulled forward about five years of, a, of expected online sales growth in, in just five months. So uh, if you use Prologis and our 1 billion square foot platform as a proxy, uh, e-commerce has historically been about 20% of our leasing volume. Well, in the third quarter alone, it was 37%, nearly double. So uh, pretty, pretty amazing. And, and this isn't just an Amazon story either. Uh, th there are all sorts of third-party logistics providers that are representing a big portion of this e-commerce demand. Uh, th there are uh, all sorts of uh, uh, parcel delivery companies. I know I say it's not just an Amazon story, uh, but Amazon's building this giant parcel delivery network all due to to uh, e-commerce, but I would say the most profound impact to e-commerce as a driver of demand is the 3x multiplier. And that 3x multiplier is what it, it requires uh, in space to service the e-commerce demand compared to tr uh, traditional throughput uh, distribution. Uh, if you think about uh, online order fulfillment requires um, more space because everything is taking place at one spot. 100% of the inventory is in the warehouse versus store shelves. This allows for greater product variety, uh, deeper inventory levels, and, and then very space intensive partial shipping operations and, and other value add activities uh, such as uh, returns, processing returns. So a uh, huge driver. And like I said, we're just getting started. Yep. Kevin, you're on uh, mute there. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now we're going to go to sort of the uh, the flip side of the impact of e-commerce and talk a little bit about retail. You know, big box retail is mentioned in this top 10 and first it's rise in terms of uh, what it's done to Main Street businesses across the country, um, but also um, what's happened as e-commerce sales have exploded. Um, so maybe give us a little, um, and, and I'm talking about Stan here. Uh, Stan, maybe give us a little sort of timeline of how things have folded out over the last uh, 10 years and uh, the impact on uh, the big box segment of your industry retail. Okay, 10 years, two minutes. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, here, here are the takeaways, and then we'll use our time to discuss it. Um, takeaways of big box just became, you know, over 20 years or so, uh, another form of retail distribution, another value quality proposition. It has been, will be, and will continue to be an important part of retail. Uh, but if you do not have a value and or quality proposition to the customer, your consumer, you're not gonna survive, regardless of interest rates or anything that goes on. Uh, second, uh, e-commerce is not evil. In fact, it's a true benefit to retail. Uh, if you think about distribution and you want to go way back to when, you know, in the 1500s and people wheeled things to county fairs and uh, markets and carts, and then we evolved to stagecoaches and shipping and 
automobiles and trucking and airplanes, e-commerce is just another form of technology of distribution within retail. And again, to the extent that you have a value quality proposition and you have the capital to invest in uh, e-commerce, it's a true benefit. It, and uh, it is being embraced by those who are successful. It's adding to their volume. It's uh, helping build the brand, which then for, therefore reinforces the big box nature of having to have brick and continue to have brick and mortar stores. So it's actually a very good story. And, uh, you know, Dan, as you said, uh, if you don't have a value quality proposition and if you're not financially uh, uh, solvent, uh, you know, e-commerce and then particularly the pandemic has just accelerated the demise of certain brands, but not the big idea of big box being part of retail. So you're 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 not feeling like uh, e-commerce is just going to destroy um, you know what's going on in bricks and mortar stores? Not at all. It may be evolved size of stores, number of store expansion, but no, not at all. It's it's just an integral part of uh, what retail is today, uh, as as it has evolved and always evolved over hundreds of years. Uh, give, me ten more, give me ten more seconds. I'll just say that. If you watch a Western movie or if you've never seen a Western movie because you're not old enough, everything about a Western movie still applies to sort of real estate today, not e-commerce, but real estate. Came up with a horse, you know, set, you tied it up, that was your car in a parking spot. Saloon was food and beverage, boarding house was residential. No, nothing's really changed, just how it's presented and technology has changed. Adam, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I, was saying, I don't know that we have the Q3 numbers yet, but e-commerce as a percentage of total retail sales, right? I think Q2 came out at like 16%. This is the, the height of the lockdown. Nobody leaves the house, can't go anywhere. And yet brick and mortar was still you know, 84 plus or minus percent of total retail sales, right? So I think the, the strength of brick and mortar isn't, you know, it's not going anywhere, right? We're still going to go to shops. Maybe that experience changes, right? The nature of what that brick and mortar experience is. Um, but to Dan's point, right, I mean, there, there is a huge, huge room to grow for e-commerce at only 16%, given this lockdown experiment we're all in, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of room for that to continue to change. And uh, I think that's why we see it on the future trends as, as one of the top billings as well. Okay. All right. Well, Adam, I'm going to stay with you and your fancy podcast-like studio <laughs> there, which I am, am very envious of. Um, and let's talk about interest rates, lower interest rates. It was the number one um, on the, the, the survey in terms of impact of the mark on the market. It's easy to get numb to how low interest rates are. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Stan certainly and I remember when interest rates affecting real estate were really, really high. And I think we're probably permanently scarred by that. Um, but, you know, in terms of it, in terms of its impact on the real estate market, um, give us a sense of what that low cost of in interest rates and capital in general has done for the real estate market. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking before we jumped on today, I think it's, uh, my take on this is going to be a bit through a, a different lens than, than maybe some of the others, because my whole career from early 2000s today has been in a fairly historically low interest rate environment, right? Um, so, generally when you have such a low interest rate environment for such a long time, you're going to see values get pushed. And I think we've seen just tremendous asset price increase, not just in real estate, right? In the general economy as a whole, we've seen great asset inflation and, and uh, increase in prices. So generally low interest rate environments are going to push, they're going to push pricing. Um, you combine that with some of the other factors on here, right? Real estate becoming a larger portion of institutional capitals allocations, um, certainly what we're up to with, with RealCrowd and, and bringing access to more retail investors, right? There's so much liquidity coming into the space. When you combine that with such a low interest rate environment, you're going to see asset values just continually increase. Um, you know, one of the, the interesting points that was brought up in a comment to the survey was given this, this increasing in allocation for real estate for institutional investors, uh, more people focusing on this as a, a part of their portfolios, and a lot of them looking for yield, when you have asset values increasing so much, where do you get that yield, right? You have to kind of get more out on that risk spectrum. You have to go outside the core markets. And we've seen a lot of activity, secondary, tertiary markets, and, you know, even institutional buyers going to markets that 10 years ago, you'd never expect to see them, right? I mean, Portland, where we're at, um, 10, 15 years ago was, was barely sniffing an institutional market. And now there's a ton of institutional capital chasing deals here in, in Portland and some of the more 
um, you know, now more accepted kind of mainstream secondary markets, maybe we'll call them that. Um, so I think, again, that, that's a, a, a trend that we'll, we've been told by the Fed, right? They're going to keep interest rates low for the next at least three years. Um, at some point, you know, someone's going to have to pay the piper for all the stimulus that's been pumped in the market. So you would imagine that at some point those rates, and that's maybe where we see some of this uh, conflict in the future of, of low interest rates, but rising interest rates as a future. So I think with that, I mean, again, Kevin and, and Stan, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. You know, when you're borrowing at eight to 10 percent, when my entire career I've known, you know, three, four percent as like as the top now. And we I heard a couple months ago. Uh, someone rate locked a deal, a multifamily deal here in, in Vancouver, Washington, two and a half percent IO full term 10 years, right? And at like 65% loan to value. So just absurd loan amounts that, that can, can make a lot of deals pencil that if you have a little bit more um, higher interest rate environment, uh, those deals just don't make anymore. So I'm, I'm just curious how that looked back in the you know, 80s, 90s when, when borrowing costs were you know, high, high single digits, low double digits. Well, it didn't look as nearly as fun as two and a half percent IO for 10 years. I'll tell you that. Um, it's interesting how um, cap rates have follow, followed uh, interest rates down, long-term interest rates down pretty steadily. Um, not always in the short term, but over the long term, very, very high correlation. So that, and, but that goes for all assets, right? All asset values are influenced by a lower cost of capital. Um, so, Okay. Let's, uh, and we'll talk more about interest rates when we talk about the future trends. We'll come back to that. Lisa, let me go to you. Um, large cities have had a good run over the last decade. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could talk a little about how, um, particularly on the office side, how these large cities have become more attractive as office locations where, again, for a lot of my career, it was companies were fleeing to the suburbs. Right, right. Well, uh, it's been a pretty major shift, and I, I think we are seeing it in most urban areas. Um, I'll speak to a little bit to some of the experiences here in Chicago. Um, a lot of that has, it really, the, the name of the game is talent, um, and that's why companies are looking where, where they can get the great, greatest level of talent and where they can create the environment that will attract and retain that talent. I think a lot that was learned over over the last 10 years was really the cost of replacement. If you have good talent, that cost of replacement can far exceed the cost of maybe the savings that you might get from a real estate perspective by relocating to a lower cost environment. Um, and I think that that is probably one of the biggest drivers. Um, I'd say the next piece of that then goes into sort of what cities have been able to create those work live play environments, right? With those multifamily developments and retail and all of the experiences that really, um, and that's why I think you're seeing the, um, the explosion of new Submarkets, like for instance in Chicago, a Fulton Market type of an area that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? And so in the last 10 years, basically this drive for labor, as well as this drive for an environment that creates the best mousetrap to keep that labor engaged at the office has been the development of actually new submarkets and new types of, of approaches to development. I think the other piece is, is, going to, is around transportation. I find that some of, particularly, I know it was kind of interesting in our survey that we didn't get that, that much into sustainability, at least for the last 10 years, but definitely we're seeing that some of the newer generations that are in the workforce are much more focused on a more sustainable type of a work environment. And for that, public transportation becomes a pretty important piece. Now that's kind of interesting to think about as we will talk a little bit further about what's happening now and certainly public transportation is challenged because of, of the COVID environment, but we do believe that there will be a return to public transportation. Um, so I think when you look at like, for instance, a Chicago, you could say the same thing um, about a Milwaukee is you've got major urban areas that are also hub and spoke. And so there's a broader, the urban area basically allows you to basically retract, attract talent from the entire metro area of a marketplace, whereas um, if you're in one specific suburban marketplace, you find that you, your labor attraction and your, so your, your accessibility becomes a lot more limited. So putting those two piece, all of those pieces together, it's really been a surge for, for downtown. And, and you know, we'll get into it a little bit further about what the future looks like, but um, it'll be interesting to see if we see any shift to some of those trends. But right now, really the focus is talent, public transportation, Sort of creating environments where you you look at retent not only recruitment but retention of your employees and that's that's why cities have done well now i will say on the flip side 
you know, cities are more expensive, right? But I think that people are willing to look at that trade-off as to their, their cost of housing and, and their, their personal living expenses as compared to, they just look at something that's a little more manageable because they get the better job. I do think there's gonna be one interesting trend going forward, which is work from home has proven that you don't have to be in the same office, city as your offices, right? And so I think that the talent pool that companies will be able to look at going forward is gonna be a much broader national, if not sort of global opportunity. And that's going to probably take this whole idea of talent and sort of what the office looks like to a whole new level going forward. And we'll, when we talk about future trends, we will definitely spend some time on that. It's yeah, a fascinating, definitely. fascinating yeah. topic. Yeah. Um, so the, Andy, if you could put the top tens up, back up, that slide back up, that would be uh, helpful. So there, we're showing these top 10 um, responses um, that you all um, voted on, essentially, when you took the survey. Um, but there were lots of other interesting trends. So was there anything, and, and I'll go to each of the panelists for a quick answer, anything that was not in the top 10 that kind of uh, surprised you? So uh, we'll, Adam, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think, again, it kind of ties in with some of these, but to me, it was the decline of shopping malls. Right? I was surprised that didn't come in higher. Um, I think we're still in the, the transition of that and, and COVID-19 has certainly been an accelerant of a lot of these already kind of in place trends. Um, but that's a lot of retail space that's going to have to be reconfigured, re repurposed, repositioned, you know, someone, I forget, it was one of our podcast episodes. I uh, said, so we're not, we're not overdeveloped in retail, we're under demolished. Mm -hmm. And so how, you know, how do you repurpose millions and millions and millions of square feet of functionally obsolete retail, especially coming in a post post COVID world, you know, who knows what that looks like. So that was one that I think uh, could have, could have hit top 10. Okay. Uh, Dan, and thoughts? Yeah, mine was uh, by far labor. I, I, I was surprised to see labor so far down. And I think there was two categories. One was cost and the other one was shortages. And really either one of them. It's by far the number one pain point for our customers. It has been all of last cycle. It has been through the pandemic. And, uh, and we've actually been employing different strategies around it to help our customers find employees. We, we've created this uh, uh, initiative called Community Workforce, which allows us to kind of kill multiple birds with one stone, but it's, 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 it's putting our money where our mouth is in communities and going and starting programs with other industry organizations to hire high school grads or uh, teach them about the logistics industry and, uh, and, and try to help our customers find their future employees. And it's been uh, really successful. We're actually scaling it now uh, at a global level, but it's, it's, we had to turn to this in order to really we're customer centric we want to make sure we're doing all things we possibly can to help our customers and, and it's it's what they see as their number one issue so okay stan what about you oh you're on mute stan it may have been buried in one of these and maybe not as specific but uh, uh the whole issue maybe within labor too of diversity uh not not that it's only a good thing to do in your company, but you need really to project forward that your clients, your customers, your vendors, your lenders, your um, institutional investors are all gonna look at you as, as a company to see your evolution in the world of diversity and attracting labor pool. In fact, even attracting labor pool and uh, your workers are gonna really rank you, so to speak, like we have up here on the screen, uh, as to your diversity as one of the factors in making that decision. So yeah. um, I think yeah. that's in, absolutely important. And the real estate industry by and far is behind many others. So we have a lot of work to do. We do, we do. Lisa. No, I, I'll be asking you, I was shocked that there wasn't, um, that workplace shifts and workplace strategy, strategy shifts wasn't in the top 10. If you think about the last 10 years, I mean, the impact that, you know, really the beginning was densification, right? Which was sort of the initial push to get people to come from the suburbs downtown because with densification, the typical suburban office space with 250 square feet per person or per employee and four per thousand parking became untenable, right? You were, you're looking, you were getting down to 150, 125 square feet per person. And then that sort of evolved. And so that was really a densification process. Then it evolved into alternative work strategies, which have really been the name of the game for the last five years, um, looking at 
not just hoteling, but you know, free address systems and trying to create more collaboration areas and thinking about the way that you work much more differently where you were, you know, free addresses, you work in the type of work, work seat or workspace that you need to for the work that you're doing. So all of that has been really front and center and has been a way for companies to think about how they save money on their office space, but also how they build again that better mass, uh, mousetrap to, to capture the right type of employees. So I, I was pretty surprised because it's been a, a big piece of basically growth, change, suburban, urban. It, it's, it's been a, a big driver. Okay. Um, I, I mis mistake, I misspoke earlier, directing people to the chat. You should go to the Q&A to post questions. We have one um, in terms of the, uh, really the impact or interplay between lower interest rates and higher construction costs. Um, what does that look like over the last 10 years? I'll just open up to anybody who wants to answer before we move on to the future trends. Maybe but for low interest rates and uh, the fact that uh, construction costs have risen and then in urban environments at least, you know, the real estate tax and other burdens have risen, obviously very important here in Chicago. So, but for low interest rates, we wouldn't have had any of the development that I think in the last couple of years. Yeah, is the rent growth in, in at least residential or commercial retail, I can't speak to industrial, Dan, uh, just would not support it. Yeah, yeah I would just add that the, the cost to entitle, the, co the cost to do business in these municipalities around the country, it, I'm in Chicago here, it, it's getting more and more expensive every day. So you add that on to it. Thankfully, there is some sort of relief yeah. as it relates to interest rates. Yeah, the the definitely the the co cost of construction has worked um, sort of in the opposite direction as the as the um, uh, low interest rates. Um, okay, we have another question, um, and it talks about the you know we have this concern about oversupply of family multifamily development. Is that still an issue? And maybe I'll turn to Adam to into that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a hard to blanket the entire country in one picture of of demand and supply, right? But I think you look at some of the things we'll probably talk about the the millennial shift, right? Home ownership is very hard to attain for a very large portion of our uh, population. Um, so you look at affordability and renting is is likely the only option for a lot of folks out there. Um, you look at demographics. You look at um, you know, population growth. I don't think long term we are anywhere near oversupplied in multifamily as a whole. Again, I think there's obviously pockets of the country that'll have different demands or different dynamics. Um, but I think again, both in single family for rent too, right? I mean, that's a new, a fairly new asset class that's that's caught the institutional eye. Um, we've even seen a few project late, projects lately where it's you know a, a an entire community of single family for rent, right? So not just amassing a portfolio of onesie twosie houses, but home builders building 100, 200, 300 single family homes for rent. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of demand again for uh, housing as rental, right? I don't think we're oversupplied for where we see the demand going in the future. Okay. Great. Um, well, why don't we turn ourselves to the future? Maybe Andy, you put that graphic back up with the top 10 just to reference uh, sort of get people referenced on the future. Some of the some of these trends have really been um, accelerated over the last year um, by uh, the pandemic, um, and the things that may were already brewing and have just been. Um, we talked about e-commerce earlier, just been turbocharged by uh, COVID. Um, so, uh, Lisa, you know, let's come back to this. Um, uh, you know, trend of talking about um, work from home, um, that experiment that's been forced on us uh, <laughs> by the pandemic. Um, you know, post COVID, you know, let's get back to, you know, fast forward maybe as much as a year from now. Let's, let's think about that. You know, how will this impact two things? First, how corporations think about what they're trying to do in terms of what setting up office spaces and, and still attracting talent and getting their employees together for interaction, which has been made harder during the last year. Um, but also just kind of the aggregate demand for office space going forward, which I think everybody's kind of struggling with. 
Sure, sure. I think that um, there are a lot of factors at play here. Um, I think first and foremost, as I was mentioning earlier, we had seen sort of this, this focus on maybe more of a dense, densified type of an environment. Um, there was already some, some work with giving people the opportunity to, to work from home, but obviously through this process, a lot of companies that were hesitant to let all levels of their employees work from home were forced to do that. And it's been proven that in certain categories it works. And so I think going forward, what we're gonna see is um, a couple of things. At first, um, if I were just to make a grand sweeping statement to say what will we see as far as, as usage of office space compared to what it is today is I expect there'll probably be in most cases a 20 to 30% reduction in the amount of space, office space that, that companies would use for the same number of people that they have say today. But what's interesting about that is if you think about, let's say we go to a 100% activity-based work type of an environment and 50% of the employees are, at any one time, you have 50% of your employees in the office. It's, a, it's not a one-for-one -one ratio. You're not gonna see that 50% of the people stay home, 50% of the space is gone. You're gonna see probably more close to that 20 to 25, 30%. And a lot of that is because companies are living on the fumes of culture right now. Um, collaboration, innovation, all of those things that happen through incidental interactions with employees is just not happening. And even when you go back in the office, you know, we've got the ability to go back in the office and I'm there a couple of days a week. You know, there's, there's opportunities to talk to one person, right? Or there's opportunities to talk to two or three in a very, very large conference room, but you're still are really relying on technology to collaborate. And we're just not seeing that same sort of, sort of, sort of innovation, collaboration, culture, again, that stickiness, which is something that companies are going to have to worry about. So what we see is that space will be different. It will be more activity-based work environment, which means it will be much less assigned seats. There won't be, you know, it'll be an open environment. There are a lot of things that come from that, especially post COVID, which is it's, it's cleaner. There's the ability when you have a clean desk policy, which, you know, we have that, have had that at CBRE for six years. <coughs> You can, you can visibly clean and demonstrate to your employees that everything is clean because there aren't piles of papers and photos and all of those other things on the desk. But I think that what you'll see is that spaces will actually be created in a different way. There'll be more collaboration hubs. So where you might have seen somebody in the past maybe looking at an activity-based work environment where they'd have 175 or 180 square feet per seat, you'll see 200, 225 square feet per seat right? There will be less seats, but there will be a lot more of the we space that'll be out there. And that's really, I think, where we'll see things kind of progress. Um, as far as making decisions, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of what I'm talking to clients about, um, and it's just the early, early stages is, is saying, let's acknowledge the fact that you've got this office space and let's figure out what we're going to do with it to make it support your employees when they are ready to come back. Uh, but just as a statistic, I'll offer for Chicago as an example. We have seen a 70, downtown, we've seen a 70% increase in our sublease space since April 1st. We have 4.7 million square feet of sublease space on the market currently. We expect that we'll top out at about 5.5 to 6 million square feet of sublease space. So if you think about that, we were at 2 million square feet at the beginning of this year and sublease wasn't even really a consideration. And if you roll that back to 2008, or even to the dot-com crash when we had so much sublease space in the market, um, this is this far eclipses it. So there's a lot of recovery yet to happen. Um, so it's gonna take several years for this, this to sort of recover. So the good news is, is for occupiers, is it is gonna be a very tenant favorable market for the coming four, five years. And they'll be able to sort of let the dust settle, figure out what they need and kind of move forward. But I will say, I think there's one thing that I think will be interesting. 4.7 million square feet of space on the sublease market going up to 5.5 or 6 million square feet. I'll be curious to see in two years how much of that space ended up, there's no demand right now, right? How much of that space ends up being reabsorbed and used by, by companies just in a different way. So it'll be interesting to see once it's, the dust all settles where all those sublease spaces ended up going. Did they go to other tenants did they get reabsorbed or did they sit empty for the entire yeah. remaining term of the lease? Yeah. Yeah. Which happens to a lot of sublease space. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go back to e-commerce. Um, Dan, sticking with you on that topic, um, you know, how, how does that 
change and morph over the next 10 years? Does it accelerate? Does it plateau at some point? And kind of what are the threats to its continued growth? Are there any clouds on that horizon? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so not to correct the number that you put out earlier, Adam, uh, you'd mentioned 16%. E-commerce had jumped to 16%. It was 16% at the end of 2019, and actually it jumped to 25% at the end of April. And we think it's going to smooth out for 2020 at about 20%. Bottom line is we see a lot of runway left in the growth of e-commerce. And uh, if you uh, think about uh, how early in the pandemic so many of our customers or so many uh, retailers were affected by the supply chain, and we see this evolution happening in the supply chain again, moving from that efficiency in the supply chain to resiliency. And based on our numbers, we expect to see 400 million square feet plus of incremental demand over the next four or five years. And that's on top of a normalized uh, absorption. So uh, we, we see it, it continuing and um, uh, we're, we're very bullish about it. That, that said, uh, there, there are definitely a couple few threats to it. Uh, I'd say the first one uh, is consumer preferences. BOPIS, buy online, pick up in store, uh, is, is real. So you're leveraging that store fleet. Um, definitely would impact uh, our projection on, on the demand side. That said, BOPIS also requires rapid fulfillment. So there is, it does increase the demand on the industrial side. Um, the other real threat would be like, it would be a dramatic shift towards specialization. So there'd be less space, or excuse me, less demand for uh, second generation space. If you think about cold storage or something specific to the grocery. Um, and the third one could be, and not to bring Amazon into it again, but it could be just that they're about a third of that uh, business. And so it, it, it could be just the concentration of uh, being uh, in only one or a few customers and, and any sort of behavior change on their end. So that, that could disrupt that growth. Well, the challenge too, real uh, real quick, excuse me, it's just simply e-commerce has got to be done in a way that's going to be profitable. At some point, at least across the retail, I can't speak to other forms, but uh, in retail, if it's not going to turn out to be a profitable endeavor, regardless of how important it is, you're going to see evolution and change. So you're going to have to watch how that plays out in the next year or two in terms of earnings and, and the cost of in implementing e-commerce. You're right, Stan, and we've actually been... Uh, heavily focused on urban fulfillment because it's the one leg that the, our customers didn't really have a, a handle on a few years ago, about five, six years ago, we started really diving into this in Seattle, San Francisco. It actually led to the Georgetown Crossroads project that Andy mentioned earlier at the front end of the project. But I, uh, while ProLogis was built on an infill strategy, okay, now get closer. Uh, I think when I moved to Chicago uh, into this role two years ago, we owned like one building in Chicago. We owned 62 million square feet in Chicago, in the Chicago greater metro market, but we had one or two buildings in the city. Now we've invested about 250, 300 million in, in 10 different projects. And we're going to continue to do that because really real estate's only 5% or so of the supply chain cost. So we're trying to get closer to that uh, density of income to make it that much less expensive for the user uh, at the end of the day to um, deploy their e-commerce strategy. Yeah, which gets us back to the last mile issue that was noted um, in, the, in the survey. So um, let's go back to interest rates. As Andy pointed out earlier, um, we've got uh, continued low interest rates and higher interest rates on the top 10 for uh, looking forward. So Stan, which, which is it gonna be lower or higher um, and, and sort of the impact on the market as you see it. They'll stay low. We're going to be like Japan. Uh, this country can't afford a rise in interest rates from consumer debt, student debt. Uh, every pro forma that's probably been developed in the last five years has no uh, increase in interest rates or rising cap rate sensitivities to them significant enough to take an increase in interest rates or cap rates. So I think the Fed and the government are just going to have to. Uh, unless there's some you know, really strong external world events that drive it differently. So they're going to stay low. 
and the generation that's grown up with them will continue to somewhat benefit from that. But, uh, you know, there's a curse in that. So, you know, add a few columns to your spreadsheets, if you don't mind, and tack on a few different interest rates or cap rates and see what the deal looks like. Correct. So I'll put you on the spot. What's the 10 year treasury look like in five years from now? Uh, one and a quarter. Okay. What, what about you, Adam? What do you think? Uh, who the hell knows? <laughs> um, I would say we're probably between uh, 150, 200 basis points somewhere. I think a little higher than Stan, right? I mean, there's just been so much money that's been pumped in with this stimulus and, and who knows what stimulus is to come. Um, you, you can't help but think that's going to have a, an upward push on, on rates. What, what about you, Dan? What do you think? Right when Stan was saying 125 basis points, in my head was 175, which actually goes right in between what Adam said. Lisa, do you have a different view? Nope, I'm I'm right there with those guys. How about you, Kevin? This is this is a lo- wait a minute. You're asking me. Yeah, <laughs> my of course. Um, yeah, I would I would uh, I'd probably be the high. I'd be sort of like two and a half. Um, uh, five years is a long time, and. Uh, the, the printing of money that we've been doing, especially during the pandemic, um, will, you know, but that's, but two and a half, when you put it in a longer perspective is nothing compared right. to what we've been. So um, anyway, okay. Um, so let's talk briefly, uh, Adam, about technology. You know, what are the big things that are going to happen um, in the next decade um, uh, that are going to impact the real estate market? Yeah, I mean, your real estate has always been a fairly slow industry to adopt and adapt to new technology. Um, Dan, I mean, your industry has probably seen the biggest change with automation and everything that's going on and and logistics and and warehouse space. Um, I think the autonomous vehicles thing, right? I mean, maybe that's a little bit Jetsons. I don't think we're there in the next 10 years. I mean, they're in a material way, right? That's going to have a material impact on on how we use space. To me, what's most interesting, right? I mean, we carry around these sensors and, and devices with us everywhere we go 24 hours a day, right? We have these sensors on us. Um, so to me, what's going to be super interesting is now that we're collecting all this data, what the heck do we do with it, right? How do our buildings interact with this data that's collecting? Um, how can we have some of these smart buildings, whether it's again, from a health side, which elevator bank do you go in, right? Which office seat are you in? As Lisa was saying, you know, which portion of the office are you in? Um, how do we make sense of this data? How do we use that data? To me, that's what's really going to inform how we interact with the space. So that from a technology perspective, I think that's kind of the next frontier is, is how are we going to leverage all of these sensors and, and everything that we're doing with collecting of data. Um, and with that, again, you know, the privacy side, who owns that data? What can you do with it? How do you make sure that you're doing it responsibly? Um, so that to me, I think is where technology will have the biggest impact going forward and how we use space. Obviously, there's operational efficiencies through software, whether it's, you know, property management, asset management, um, there's improvements and efficiencies that we can get through technology, but truly transformative, I think is going to be how we use this, all this data that we're collecting now. Okay. Yeah. Well, the Jetson sounds a little more sexy, but <laughs> you, you're, you're I, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably right. Um, so let's, uh, let's go back to this migration question, Lisa, that sort of is at the heart of some of these work from home questions. Um, are, are millennials going to swing this urban suburban pendulum back to the suburbs um, post COVID um, as they age, as they have families? Uh, where do you see that? And what's, what's going to be the impact on both CBDs and suburbs? Sure. You know, that's been a big question. And a lot of people have been thinking about that, particularly during this COVID time, because, and I'm going to answer some of the questions in the chat too, that I'm seeing Thank that are are directed my way. Um, certainly there is a lot of trepidation around public transportation right now. And so the thought is, is will that lead to um, companies wanting to basically reverse their, their path and move back to the suburbs? I don't think so because of the under fundamentals, the underlying fundamentals that I talked about earlier uh, in that people are looking, to, you know, talent is still gonna drive this collaboration, innovation, all of those pieces. And so, Um, the odds are that companies that are located downtown do not have one specific location in the suburbs that that sort of works for them. Again, knowing that most of our urban environments are pretty, are pretty tight in sort of hitting all of the different sort of suburban areas that they attract from. 
But what I do think will happen is, is again, we're going to have more of these collaborative hubs that I, I mentioned is the way that we work. There will be more activity-based work and that it is possible that we will see touchdown spaces that will go into the suburbs. I kind of asks this other question about whether or not spaces will be, uh, will there be a lot of private offices in, in spaces? And, and I, I don't think so. I think that um, there are ways to lay out space in a more open environment that creates an, um, more of a, a activity-based work, socially distanced, but still provides that collaboration. So I think once we get past this crisis, eventually people will get back on public transportation and, and they will go to a more open environment, but they'll go to work when they need to collaborate with people and when they need to do head down tasks, they will stay home. Mm -hmm. And I think that people will be able to become comfortable with sort of that risk assessment that goes along with that. Um, I do think that millennials will move to the suburbs because they have kids and until the urban areas figure out education challenges and cost and all of those things, that's gonna be just a driver that's gonna happen. Uh, but again, I think that if the majority of the enticing jobs are downtown, folks are going to still come downtown for those jobs or come to the urban areas for those jobs. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go to, before we end, let's go to some of the questions that have been posted online by all of you. Um, let me go to you first, Dan, um, in terms of, can you talk about green building development? Um, and what has been the attitude of your customers about the importance of that? What features do they want to see? Um, and, you know, does, does anything um, on that list really impact the feasibility, you know, the, the numbers in terms of uh, developments you're looking at? Sure. When we got into lead uh, construction 15 years ago or so, it's kind of at the forefront of that, uh, Prologis was all over that. And, and, uh, um, I was uh, involved in the first uh, lead building in the state of Washington. Uh, we did the same one, it's the same with Illinois. And, and so uh, we've been really at the forefront of it for some time. And the interesting piece of it was customers not to be named would refuse to pay for that incremental increase, despite that ESG plug they would get as a, as a buyer of that space. So we decided um, uh, we would, uh, start spending that money and 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 we started really small and then now we build all our buildings lead and we're starting to see those customers that were the same real estate directors that were pushing back on us and being pretty hard on us on it are now begging us to uh, employ even more green strategies or uh, uh, and uh, so it's good to see some more adoption and in some of these big fortune 500 companies they're they're signing up for, for this for some time right and i think it's the responsibility of all of us as developers to make these decisions today that are hard because they're expensive uh but uh we're, we're doing we're making these decisions for things that we just need in the future what, what, what's going to happen with ev vehicles right uh, what sort of provisions do you need to put in your into your uh into your spec today to account for that in the future it's just a little bit of money but it's incremental, it's those nickel and dimes that start hurting those performers, right? And uh, it depends where you are around the country. Solar, obviously a huge sustainability um, feature. Well, in the central part of the country, it, you don't see the subsidies and it, it just, it doesn't pencil. So you're definitely taking it in the chin on the cost side. Where on the coast, we, we see all sorts of subsidies and uh, in California and New Jersey and otherwise. So our customers want it more, uh, we, we uh, have a huge focus on it, um, and uh, and and we're going to continue to be an industry leader on this front, knowing that it's just going to cost a little bit more money, but it's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, I, was, and I think we I was going to say real quick. I, I think again, real estate again is a very slow industry to adopt to these new things, right? So the the greater financial industry, I think, has a very big focus on ESG, and a lot of that's being driven by the LPs, right? The fund investors that are saying no. I'm, I'm, you know, in working in their mandates that they, they need to have these different focus with those funds that they're going to invest. And so, Dan, I'm, I'm curious if you're seeing from the LP side, from the buyers, if you're starting to see some of those mandates come with more of that ESG consciousness, I think that'll be, to me, that's the driver because, like you said, it, it doesn't make sense to, to build it in there just because you're going to take the cost hit on it, right? If there's not, if there's not value perceived on the other end. So, to me, that's almost a, an LP-driven shift that, that hopefully our industry is waking up to? Uh, yeah, quick answer, Adam, is we're seeing it from really all of our stakeholder constituencies, yeah, right? Both our tenant customers as well as our investor customers. It's absolutely uh, one of the top few topics that we 
um, we cover with them. So Andy, do we have time for one more question? Uh, we're just about to the end of our time here, Kevin. Uh, so I think we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and wrap up. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the last word to our panel. Oh, thank you. This is, this is great. We obviously, I think we could sit here and talk for hours about a lot of the topics and we didn't, didn't get to uh, not only all of uh, the questions we had been thinking about uh, as a panel, but also some of the questions uh, that popped up online. I apologize for that, but uh, that's, uh, we'll, we do need to get you out of here in a timely fashion. So uh, thanks to the panel. It was great. And I will, uh, I will of course, uh, echo that. Uh, thank you to our incredible panelists. You've been uh, un unbelievable discussion today. And what's really fun is that uh, it's going to be, it's going to be neat to follow these trends as we go forward. And uh, you know, at some point, I do anticipate we'll look back on the survey uh, and on our comments to see where we were, where were we were on, how good were we, and um, you know, where were we maybe on the right track, but even if it wasn't uh, quite there. Uh, last reminder for our audience, please remember that Gold Needle Gala Silent Auction is, is open, closes tomorrow at 6 p.m. So please go view the items and bid, geg2020.givesmart.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been uh, such a privilege to have you for this real estate conference series virtually this fall. Again, uh, my name is Andy Hunt. I'm the director of the Center for Real Estate, and we appreciate all of your support. Wishing everyone a wonderful day and uh, season ahead. Take care, everybody.